So bow your heads with me. Let's have a word of prayer. And then um, we're going to review and walk through the text and hear what God is saying to us. Father, we thank you for you. Open our hearts, God. You are a wonderful God, Lord. It's been three weeks in this chapter of John chapter 11 and looking at the story of Lazarus. And now, God, we are coming to a place where we see that we're always on your time, not our time. And sometimes that's hard to swallow. Sometimes it's difficult, Lord, because we want to be about us. But I thank you for the level of transparency we've been receiving, what we've been learning. And so as we stand for these next few minutes to wrap up this passage, Lord, I'm praying, God, that we would be able to see ourselves in the text, Lord. We would see ourselves in in what you've illustrated and how you've done what you've done, God, throughout the entirety of Scripture. My prayer this morning, like you've been dealing with me all week, is to open, open all of our hearts, Lord, to adjust. Your goal is to breathe life into congregations that are dead, into homes that are dead, God, into marriages that are dead, into relationships that have become lifeless. Teach us now how to understand the truth that you are the resurrection and the life. So we give our hearts and our time to you, God. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Go with me to John chapter 11. And I'm going to pick up in um, verse 33, and then we're going to read to the end of it. But before um, I do that, I want to walk you through, uh, just briefly review what we've been talking about for the past few weeks so you can be brought up to speed. Here's the big idea of what we've been sharing every week for the past three weeks. Number one, that is sometimes God or Jesus delays responding to our request for help, so his intervention results in God being glorified. Please get that in your spirit. Please get that in your heart, that God will delay responding to our request for help so his intervention results in God's being glorified. Here's what I've been saying all week. I've been saying all week that God sometimes does his best work on the back end of our craziness. And and I'm comfortable in saying we miss God because, here's what I've been saying Wednesday night, because he didn't show up when we wanted him to show up, Now we're doing us on the back end, and we shut out any opportunity for God to move or God to work because we think it's too late. What's the point? What what does it matter? You know, I'm doing me now. But he does does his best work back there. And what that really says to us is that God is always on his time. Come on, say it with me. Say, God is always always on his time. time. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, God is always on his time. Okay. Now, I had a three-point sermon, and I broke it up into three weeks. The first week, I kind of shared with you that God is glorified when we learn the truth that we are on His time, not ours. That's very, very important that we learn that. And the sub-points that we kind of talked about was that a personal relationship with God has no impact on God adjusting His time frame to ours. I want to rehash that. Just, Just give me two seconds to do this. Here's how I've been saying it for the past three weeks. How deep, how spiritual, how holy, how much we pray, all of that stuff does not cause God to stop his plan just for us. Okay? I want us to get this in our spirit. Yes, it's good to be deep. Yes, it's good to be holy. Yes, it's important for all that stuff. But it doesn't cause God to adjust to our time frame. The providence of God, number two, mandates that all our experiences work together for his glory. Okay? Now, let me say real quick about this by way of review. Whatever you've gone through in yesterday is to position you for what God wants to do through you tomorrow, okay? Now listen to this. This is why this is important. If you thought yesterday was all about yesterday and you're living, he hurt me, she hurt me, this happened, and you're letting go of yesterday to the extent that you're moving on tomorrow without giving God an opportunity to still fix yesterday today, you might miss God. Yeah. Don't think it's done. And I'm done, and I'm moving on. God does his best work on his time, not ours, okay? So we need to seize the moment we're working with God and to be on mission with God. And then the other part is that Jesus intentionally delays his intervention to place us on his time. He will show up when he wants to just to get us to where he wants us to be. Secondly, God is glorified when we recognize that he is the resurrection and the life. I'm going to flesh this out a little more um, today, because I don't know that we understand that quite well, here's the sub-points. Time bears, bears no factor on Jesus' ability to bring life to our dead situation. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It could be a thousand years, and he can still do it. 
Yeah, time bears no factor, okay? Here's the other part. The omnipresence of God also says that location bears no factor on Jesus' ability to bring life to our dead situation. So lose the statement. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had showed up when I prayed, it wouldn't have been like this. No, he was there. Yeah, that's, that's the omnipresence of God, okay? Here's how David says in the book of the Psalms, where can I go for your, pleasure, your presence? Where can I flee? If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I ascend to the heights, even there you shall find me. Location bears no factor. So if you're praying and it feels like God is not answering or God is not showing up, it's because he's on his time clock, not ours. And it also means, you need to hear me say that this does not mean that he did not hear you. There is no sound that can be made on the face of the earth that God does not hear. Oh, wrestle with that for a moment. Are you with me? He's a big God. He's a big, big God. You can't utter a sound that the ears of God has not privy to. And then here's the third thing. He is the resurrection and he is the life. Today, I want us to see this real quick in the text, that he is glorified when we allow him to restore life to the things we have given up on. I forgot the word on here. That God is glorified. Repeat out to me. Say, God is glorified, God is glorified. When, we when we allow him to restore life, to, restore life. To, the to the things we have given up on. The reason I don't like you is because I gave up on you. And the reason you don't like me is because you gave up on me. And the reason you don't like your ex, whoever ex may be, And don't keep that only relational. It could be employment, your boss, whatever the situation is. It's because you've shut the door and you're done. And I'm going to stand before you and say that's not the heart of God. Because I thank God that he didn't give up on me. (laughs) So here's how, and I've been dying to quote this scripture for the entirety of the series um, thank God for reminding it, bringing it back to memory. Ephesians chapter 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the what? Bond of peace. For there is one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in all, through all, and over all. So if anybody or any person or any individual is here tonight that have past stuff that you've let go of and you're shut off and you're done with, but it impacts you today such that when you see the individual or individuals or anything that reminds you of your past, it puts you in a funny place, today's message is for you. Now do this again. Say, it's about me. Very, very important. It's about me, not the other person. Now the reason I want you all to hear this before I walk to the text is if it was for the other person, they'd be here and they'd be saying it's about them too. (laughs) Yeah, it's about all of us hearing what God's saying to us, okay? So I'm trusting, I'm trusting that, that you have been listening to the podcast. I'm trusting that you're going to go home and go on the iTunes and download the podcast and listen to the two, um, sorry, the two series so far. But because somebody won't do it, let me bore you with a lot of reading, and then I'm going to pick up my, my exegetical work at verse 33. So go to verse 1 of chapter 11. Um, let me begin there and pick up and allow God to have his way. Okay? You guys go to 11.1. I, oh, amen. Let's allow God to be God. You're there? Good. Now let me just read the story because somebody's new to Sunday. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was Martha Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness or illness will not lead to death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two more days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus answered, Are they not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. 
The disciples said to him, Lord, if he is falling asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest. Then he told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to heal him or to let us go to him. Uh, let me just say this parenthetical in verse 15. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so you may believe. Um, I'm just going to say this by way of parenthetic. A lot of the reasons that God doesn't show up to our situation is so on the back end he can do his best work and grow us up even more. Now, hear me out. The person I am today is not the person that I was yesterday, okay? Now, what's ironic about my yesterday is yesterday I thought I was deep. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? You kind of get what I'm saying? And then the previous yesterday I thought I was deep. But every time God shows me how shallow I really am... <laughs> You get what I'm saying? Isn't that our problem today? In the moment, we talk about how deep we are. I'm good. No, you're not. No, until God shows you when he shows up to do his work. So he's doing everything for our sake. Verse 16, so Thomas called a twin, said to the fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Verse 17, this was last week's message. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console with them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha, verse 21, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, help us all. 22, but even now I know whatever you ask from God, God will do it. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise up in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am. Ego in me is the Greek term, the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Verse 27, yes, Lord, she said, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God who is coming into the world. 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary privately. Lord, that's funny. And the teacher is calling you. You better come tell him off real quick. Paraphrase, okay? <laughs> when he heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly to go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33 is where we're going to pick up today. Now notice this. And let me, let me just talk you through the text exegetically, then I'm going to go back and just talk to it by way of application. So when Jesus sees her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, notice what the text says. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And verse 34 says, he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And verse 35 says, Jesus wept. And in those 30, 36, and I'm going to explain this in a little while. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And then verse 37 is striking. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? Now, what's striking about these verses, let me just say this real quick, and then I'm going to come back and, and draw some applications from it. Jesus was moved by the emotion that was happening at the time of the text. Now, what I don't, the mistake I don't want you to make, I don't want you to make the same mistake that the Jews and the crowd were making when Jesus was on his way to Lazarus' grave site. Here is what would happen. The culture dictated that when a person died, they would normally hire a couple of flutists, and they would hire at, at minimum, historically, culturally, at minimum, one whaler. And this is not Bob Marley and the whalers. This is one whaler. And what the whaler would do, they would express grief at the extreme level. So there were women who would be for hire to signify that somebody has died, and I'm talking about noise. Are y'all with me? 
screaming, hollering, wailing. I mean, they would make some, oh, Lord, ladder that, Lord, Jesus. You know what I mean? They'd just go on and on and on and on and on. And it was to express sympathy to the family. And so notice what happens. The Jews now, they see Jesus, not that he's wailing like the wailer would do, but because he emoted and he expressed emotion, they misinterpreted Jesus' emotion for direct love for Lazarus. Now, not that Jesus didn't love Lazarus, but his tears was not because he loved Lazarus. His tears was because the people at the time really did not know who he was. And so that was grievous to him. That was painful to him. So, so when he expressed tears, it was over the Israelites. It was over the nation. If I were to connect that today, he expressed his tears over us because here's what we say. We know you to be the resurrection and the life, but we still serve him living dead lives. And I'm standing before you to say that when he sees that, he expresses tear of sorrow over us not knowing who he really is. Because I want you to understand, if we really knew who God was, God is, we would not be doing the things that we do. We would not be living the lives that we live. Come on, come on, come on. We would not be conducting ourselves interpersonally the way we do. So when God sees us, listen to me, he's grieved in the spirit. And these individuals did not know the depth of his pain, and they attached it and associated it to Lazarus. So here's what they say. Man, he sure loved him. Couldn't this same fellow, if he loved him so much, who opened up blinded eyes, couldn't he just release the word and raise Lazarus up? Boy, doesn't that sound like some of us? Lord, I've seen you raise Sally, so I know you're going to do this for me. Oh, come on, don't act like you hadn't done that. Lord, I know you paid her bills. Mine's due. I know I've got to be next on the list, Jesus. Come on now. Lord, I saw Mike get tickets for Elegis. I know next month they're going to call my name. So, Lord, you know, come on. No. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. We say, couldn't the God who did that for them do this for me? And I want us to understand, sometimes God will delay his purposes. So when he show up, it's not for his stuff. It's for his identity. I want y'all to hear me because a lot of us treat him like a cosmic genie and we still don't know who he is. And we live this life, Lord, have you been here? My brother wouldn't have died. This wouldn't have happened. Lord, you did that for them. Why didn't you do it for me? And we end up being mad with God, and we help God out in the after fact by making these crazy decisions without restoring the things that God, because God wants to really do a work in us. We don't go back and fix what God wants fixed in us. Are you hearing me? So he will delay, all right? So couldn't he open the blinded eyes? Look at verse 38. Jesus deeply moved. He came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And listen to Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by now there will be an odor. odor. I like King James. He stinketh by now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. For he has been dead for how long? Four days. For he has been dead for how long? I wish, I wish everybody were here last week as I spoke about the importance of that four days. And let me just reiterate just for those who are not. In Jewish culture, the mysticism or the mystery or the supposition or speculation was that the spirit hovered around the individual for a minimum of three days. And then on the fourth day, decomposition would set in and the spirit would no longer have an entry point. So he would leave and the person would, would go on to the place of the dead and the body would go through its process of decomposing. So here's what Mary is saying. I mean, what Martha is saying, Lord, here's what I, I try to tell you this. You should have come here, but all of a sudden you can come four days later. And, and now it's impossible for you to raise him. Because not only do you have the challenge of getting your father to release his spirit back into this rotten body, now you got to fix that body too. It ain't going to work. And much less there's a stench. Oh, man, we're going to deal with that in a little while. Are you with me? And, and so here's Jesus in verse 40. Jesus said to her, 
did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the what? Oh, gosh. I just want to hang out on that phrase. <laughs> did I not tell you, church, individual Felix, let me speak to myself because it's about me. If you believe, you'd see the glory of God. So take away the stone. So they took the stone away. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Got to say King James, this is bitter, come forth. And verse 44, the man who had died came out, his hand and his feet bound, um, his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him. And let him go. King James kind of says, loose the man and let him go. Let me say this, and I'm going to back up and talk about one. what I want to talk about. So notice this. Um, I see two miracles, and some commentators mention two miracles in the text. Because this is deep. Not only did Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. But I always wondered, how in the heck did Lazarus come out of the grave? Since the author gives us detail that his hand and feet was bound. Two miracles in one. So it's almost as if. Oh, y'all. That's from, I wish I was there. I'm going to ask Jesus when I go to heaven. Okay. So let's go to work. So now, to allow Jesus to restore things in our life that we have given up on. Okay, let's make application with this. Because this is about you. It's not about Lazarus. Because here's what I said to you Wednesday. Um, other than being alive, Lazarus was not shouting hallelujah. Lazarus was not saying Shonda. Lazarus was not doing nothing. He was just living life. And the authors make no mention of anything that Lazarus has been doing in the text. So I think there's direct correlation and application that God wants us to take away as it relates to the text um, with you and I today. So notice what it says, to allow Jesus to re restore life to things that we have given up on. So here's the question. What is your Lazarus situation as we end this series? What is it that you have been praying to God for? To fix, to heal, to restore, to build, to do whatever. What, whatever your Lazarus thing is. Oh, I wish I had somebody here. Number one, you must completely to surrender to Jesus by showing him where we buried our hurts. I got it, Jesus. Please understand with me, you're not God. You don't have a sea of forgetfulness. <laughs> because every time you see him, <laughs> or every time you see her, or every time you encounter the situation, I'm guaranteeing you, your memory is jolted and something gets stirs up in you and we have fooled ourselves into thinking that we have buried it. And the reason that keeps reoccurring and the reason it keeps happening and the reason it keeps surfacing is because I'm standing in front of you to say that you have hidden it from Jesus. I want you to hear me. So number one, you got to show him where it is. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Back up to verse 33. Look how he says real quick. You got to lock into this. Okay. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with him also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. And he said to them, where have you laid him? Be honest with yourself. I told you all this is going to be a counseling session. Number one, identify where you are hiding Stuff. Oh, come on. Can we talk this morning, y'all? Let's just be, I know it's Father's Day. We're going to get some big steak. I mean, it's going to be cool. I'm going to hurry up to get out of here. But I want us to be healthy. I want us to be whole. I want us to get out of these death lives that we're living after the fact. Not before it happened, but after. And the reason we're living these dead, hurt, wounded lives is because we said he should have fixed it when he had the opportunity. And he waited and didn't do it, didn't do it then so he could do it now. And he's telling you, show me where it is. 
I need to, somebody to say amen with me this morning. Show him, show him, show him where you buried the hurt. Now, here's the thing. When you're going to show him where you buried the hurt, don't make the mistake of going by yourself. Take Jesus with you. Are you with me? Are you with me? Notice Mary and Martha. Here's what the text says. They said to him, Lord, do I come and see? If you're going to go into your yesteryear in your flesh, your yesteryear might just consume you. If you're going to go into your yesterday by yourself, the reason you buried it is because your flesh surfed in the first place and we couldn't handle it. If you're going to go back, walk in the Spirit so you may not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So Holy Spirit, I need you right now because I've got to go uncover some things that I've laid hidden that's impacting my tomorrow. Take him with you. Come on, say, take him with you. Come on, say it again. Say, take him with you. Take him with you. Take him with you. Very, very important. So you've got to take him with you. And when you get there, you've got to show him. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> show him. See, it's embarrassing back there. And you're like, Lord, I can't show you this. You know what I did? And he's like, I am omnipotent. I am omniscient. Heck, I saw you when you was doing it. <laughs> and, and please nobody get offended, right? And then dumb us thinking we can hide it from him. So here's the thing. We ain't showing him because he don't know. We're showing him because he wants to be there when you deal with it. Come on, talk to me. Are you with me? He already knows. He already knows. So come on, tell Jesus, let's get in the car. We're going for a ride. We need to deal with some things. Does this make sense? Okay, so come on, say, show him where it's at. Now, a couple of things. Secondly, okay, then when you show him where it's at, number two, you must give him complete access. To the burial places. Well, Lord, you can have my hands. You can take my feet. But I can't let you in here. This is mine. Come on, does this make sense? Complete access. Say complete access. Let, let me read the text, verse, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved, came again to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay in front of it. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. Here's our prayer. Lord, I need you to fix it. And Jesus saying, I need you to move the stone. <laughs> Lord, I need you to fix it. I need you to move the stone. Because if it's up to me, I don't need the stone moved for me to fix it. I need you to move the stone so you can see what's in there, so you can see what I'm going to do. I wish I had somebody in here. Work with God. Come on, y'all. Where God is working. Yeah. You, you kind of get what I'm saying? Because if, if I don't realize how much hard work it is for me to move the stone by myself. I wish I had somebody in here. <laughs> you know, and I think everything is just pie in the sky, go lucky. I'm going to put false expectations on God. And God sometimes wants us to learn the lesson not to repeat the situation by causing us to go through what we need to go through. So I need y'all to roll away the stone. And, and this is a plug for counseling. If you can't move the stone by yourself, get somebody to help you roll the sucker away. Come on. On. Talk to me this morning. I, come on, y'all. If, if it's too big, if, if you're too afraid, if you're too nervous, listen, girl, I need you to go with me because I messed that one up really, really good. And I need somebody to stand there with me. Get help to move the stone away. Real quick. It's been four days. 
There's some stench in there. And the reason a lot of us don't want the stone moved is because we've got to uncover some things that we fool ourselves into thinking that we've gone by. So we develop a Martha mindset. I might as well leave it in place because, excuse the grammar, ain't no need in me uncovering old stuff. Yes, there is. Because it's still occupying your mind. It still has us bound. It still has us in captivity. Let me go here for those of us that have changed churches that can't get involved in ministry yet. The reason we can't get involved is because we're still in captivity and in the tomb from the old stone because of past hurt that happened 40 years ago. And we make the mistake of labeling every ministry, every preacher, every organization. Ain't nobody going to ever hurt me like that. I'm just going to go to church and I'm never going to adjourn church. <laughs> and we can never commit. We can never get involved. And we miss the glory of God in our own lives because the stone is there and we refuse to move it. Because we don't want to uncover the stench. You got to dig some stuff up to get healed, y'all. Come on, does this make sense? You got to dig some stuff up. I know some surgeons, when they, before they perform surgery, they have to cut away a lot of dead skin. They have to, to dig and get to some fresh stuff so they can do what they need to do. There's a lot of cutting away that needs to happen in a lot of our lives. Come on, give Jesus complete. You got to just go like that when it comes to God. God, I'm done. I'm done. And Lord, it's all about you. Complete access. Are you with me? Now, I've said this a few Wednesdays, and this is going to be a little heavy for some of y'all, because some of you might not be prepared to, to, to handle it, but let me say it anyway. And, and if it's offensive, take me to Starbucks and I'll apologize. Um, <laughs> the reason we can't tell the true testimony of where God brought us from is because we still have the stone in front of it and there's still some stink left in there. I'm standing before you to say when you've been delivered, when you've been brought out, who we used to be yesteryear doesn't matter anymore because who I am today is not who I was yesterday. Come on, are you with me? Who I'm going to be tomorrow is not who I am today. Come on, are you with me? But when God finishes the work, this is why I'm trying to, to lay this out to you. Take Jesus back with you. Lord, I done committed some adultery, so I need you to go back in here to work some things in me and to clean me out. And God, it was through the internet, so I got to roll a stone away so you can get in there. And God, it was this website. Matter of fact, Lord, let me be honest, it's Facebook. Expose it all and give it to him and let him deal with the work and be prepared for some stench. I know brothers don't like this, but I'm going to say it, brothers, because it's Father's Day. Um, I wasn't always like this, but I've grown to the place where every member of my household has every password that I have to anything that I own. I wasn't always like that. I had a code under the code. <laughs> I mean, are you with me? And some of y'all got like four deep. <laughs> but, but there comes a point where you got to say enough is enough. And come on, come on, y'all. Come on. And let go of yesterday. And let's move on to who God would have us to be. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. The third one, okay? Now, here's the thing. If you're going to allow God to restore things we've given up, number three, you must trust God to restore life. 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 Come on, say it with me. Say, trust God, trust God. to restore life. Restore one more time. Say, trust God, trust God. to restore life. Now, now I, need to, I need to say this carefully, and I want, I want to read it. Let's just look at the text, and let me let the text speak. Okay, what verse is that? Verse 42. Let's look at the text and let it speak. Okay, you guys are there? Okay, so they took away the stone, verse 41. Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have what? Heard me, and I know that I knew that you always what? 
hear me. Now watch this. But I say this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Okay? So, so here's what Jesus is saying in verses 41 and 42. God, I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing this for my benefit. I'm really walking this process out for the people around me so they can understand a process so you can be glorified when you show up in your time. Now watch this. And when he had said these things, he, he, the, the open out, he, he says this real loud. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come out. This is deep. Because before he raised his voice, he says, hey, God, let the record reflect. I really don't have to raise my voice. I really don't have to go through nothing. All I'm just doing it so the people could understand process and how we do what we do. The stone is moved, smell is coming out, and Lazarus is up in the thing, laying horizontally, and, and, and the argument is whether, it's, whether it was a vertical, or vertical tomb or a horizontal tomb. I'm one of those guys that'll cite well, commentators that says he was laying there, hand bound, feet bound, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, this is the trust part. Watch this. Verse 44. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Author's commentary. Verse 4 is for our benefit. Verse 44 is for our benefit. Verse 43 was all that's needed for Lazarus to be done. Problem with a lot of us, 43 has been spoken. We haven't lived 44 yet. Grammatically in the text, Lazarus Come forth, and if you have an ESV, notice the past tense verb. The man who had died. Not the man who is dead. It's written in the perfect tense, I'm going to explain, and the active voice. Here's what the perfect sense says. Past action. Ongoing results in the present, but the focus is not the past, it's the present. So listen to what that means. Lazarus, come out! And the possibility exists because God said it, that at the moment Jesus spoke, you had a live person living in the tomb. Because the perfect said it was done. The reason I need to wrestle with that, I need y'all to hear me say this, your problem is not what God can do. <laughs> your problem is the fact that you still like laying. Yeah, 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 you get it, you get it, you get it, you get it, you get it. You like people feeling sorry for you. You like being wrapped up in the linen cloth. You like your old testimony. You like your old self. You like your dead self. That's the problem. And you're laying in a tomb alive, fooling people into thinking, heck, fooling yourself into thinking you're still dead. He hurt me. She hurt me. The moment you gave your life to Christ, the resurrection released a word over you and new birth began. You started to live. The problem is your domicile was still in the tomb. Ah. Ah. And he's saying, come out! I'm church folk. I don't know if I can trust him anymore. 
choir director never, he gave my song away. <laughs> Laying in a tomb, dead, yet alive. Mummy, ghost, saved ghost, ineffective for ministry. Because you prefer the tomb, I wish I had somebody here, as opposed to coming out. The active voice in verse 44 says, Jesus did nothing to interact with Lazarus once he released the word. He could have went away, went on home to glory, and Lazarus would have still been alive. But the active voice says the subject was responsible to walk out the deliverance. God has already healed, church. That person that hurt you, the burden we're carrying, he's already forgiven us. He's not carrying it. We are. the animosity we have with each other, the distrust that we have, all that stuff that we're walking around with. Verse 43 says, it's already done. Are you with me? And, and here's the miraculous of the text. God is willing to miraculously levitate you out of the tomb while you're still bound up. That's why you're here today. You're out, but bound. <laughs> out, but still bound. And so, I like that right there. You got to be willing to release. Loose the man and let them go. Y'all have heard that. We've all heard this a million times. Whom the Son Therefore, has set what? Free is what? Yeah. Let me tell you how this works from a practical perspective. My former church, man, I had hurts, wounds that, Lord, if I start to tell you some deep stuff, I had some men in my life, not while it was happening, after the fact, when I think I'm healed and I'm moving on, restoration's going strong, those brothers came to me and said, Felix, you got to go back and uncover some stuff. And you've got to go apologize. For what? <laughs> I've been delivered, praise the Lord. Glory to his name. I wrote a song about it. No, 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 bro. Because every time you see one of them, you're going to go here, Lord, if you had been there. I guess you showed up because he's still alive. <laughs> you, you guys get what I'm saying? And God wants us to release people that we have kept bound for a long time. Unnecessarily. So Lazarus is all about God can show up today. And the thing that is keeping the church dysfunctional, the thing that's keeping our home dysfunctional, you know, some, some mishap might have happened in the marital relationship and you can't get over it. Come on. Something might have happened on a job that you can't get over. Something might have happened in ministry. Something might have happened in life and we can't get over it. This passage teaches us that God can show up after the fact. And he allowed you to go through the thing. So we can learn the processes now that whenever that happened again, I am resurrected, I am not dead, and we take the initiative, here's my Ephesians 4, to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Man, Derek, forgive a brother, man. I messed up. You kind of get what I'm saying? And we, I don't keep him in captivity, and we don't keep each other in captivity. And here what we do, we come to church, I'm just going to watch. And that's all we do is observe, waiting 
for another moment, waiting for another mishap, waiting for another something. I want you all to hear me this morning loud and clear. If you know God as your personal Lord and Savior, there ought to be nobody that you're keeping captive. And there ought to be no reason for you to keep yourself captive because God has called you out. Here's how I want to end this Father's Day. Come on, Tony. And let me, let me, yeah, just come on, come on. Come on, worship team. I want you to do like I had to do this week. Introspectively search your heart. Lord, is there something in me? Is there distrust of you in me? that has me bound, that has others bound, that has me in a place of captivity, God, where I can't fully be used by you or I'm refusing to be fully used by you. You've called me out of the grave. It's up to me to walk it out, to walk it out, to walk it out, to walk it out. So, Lord, we've got to show you everything. We must be willing to take you there to show you what it is. And when we get there, we must be willing to completely surrender and roll the stone away, give everything to you. And then, God, we must trust you that you can call life to our dead situation. Then, fourthly, we must be willing to release, unbind. So, God, as I look at myself, as we all look at ourselves, ask God, is there work that needs to be done? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here because you want a fresh start. We want to do it anew. And I'm not going to ask anybody, any minister to come to the altar this morning. I want us to do this differently. Because even our ministers and elders, if you're like me, I had to spend time on my face before God. I did. I had to spend time on my face before God and say, Lord, are there dead places that I'm still hiding? Are there wounds that I have not released yet? Or there are things that I'm still harboring that you, that might be impacting my marriage, that might be impacting my ministry, that might be impacting the things that you want for me to do. Work in me, God. The joke at the camp this week was, um, you guys that have been coming to RCF for a while, you might remember me telling you the story about the police officer when I went to report the car that gave me a ticket, wanted me to go to court and all that good stuff. The joke at the camp was the first day I show up at Peakley High School, that booger's right there. Yeah. I got to preach Sunday, mind you. And I've already been rehearsing the text. I'm like, oh, man. I'm going home. <laughs> We became really, really good friends. Really, really good friends. Because I couldn't carry nothing. I couldn't carry nothing. What's up, dog? How you doing, man? How you, man, how's it going? Watch that guy play with kids. I mean, high schoolers romping on the court. Best time, best time. Such that at the last day of the camp, he came up to me when we had presented, where Mike yeah, we presented the award to the police department Aurora and he came and said, I think you guys forget the, forgot the girls. How can I help to make sure that we don't miss that again? I'm like, watch God, you know? That's cause I was keeping that joker in the tomb. I got like four cement trucks to cover the hole. <laughs> Y'all, I'm, I'm being honest. That's a deep wound. I'm trying to mess with my character. I couldn't care less who that guy was again. But if you're going to allow God to do a work, got to go to some places and fix some things. Are you hearing me? So here's how I want to end service. I'm, well, these do the altar call. Pastor Kay, come. She's going to do an offering. Come on, buddy. Stand at your feet for a while.